Let's pray. Father, we just come to you to make space for you tonight and to welcome your presence, to make your presence welcome uh, and guide and direct us as we share tonight. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Let's, uh, we could start with some questions and answers and let me get rolling on based on the questions and the answers. So you got to have questions. They got to be easy ones too. Stephen, got a question? Anything that pertains to the spirit, we'll, we'll limit it. bottom there we go um this week something i noticed that um kind of brought me out of a place of peace that was just particularly today was just um i guess rejection came up and so that was something i knew i needed to work through and um i guess w just addressing a re rejection what's the best way to go about doing that and a uh, situation came up you lost your peace yeah lost some peace and it was clearly rejection yeah, that's actually good that you can identify to what you feel. Okay, come on up and we'll 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 minister to it, and that way everybody gets to learn how it's done as well as doing it. <coughs> um, we don't have to name a lot of stuff. Now, if we were in private, we would we could we could give a little more information, but it's real important that when it's not private, you don't really need to. All right, so just close your eyes. Put your hand down here because this is where the seat of the emotions are. This is where the rejection registers first. And so I want you to picture the person and situation. Just nod your head. Now stay focused on that person and situation and don't change the picture in your head and allow yourself to feel the feeling. Nod your head when you can feel the feeling. Okay, it's there. Let... Christ the forgiver in you, down here. Let means just let. I let Christ in me, the forgiver, go to that hurt and like right through that hurt, like a, there you just did it. Can you picture that person and feel nothing down there? Feel peace? Because they felt the flow coming out. And when the flow's coming out and the peace is coming out, that, that you own that. And a good thing to do when the scripture says test the spirit, that's good to test your own human spirit so that you have your own validation and not take somebody else's word for it. Open your eyes. Think about something else. Now go back to that person in that situation. It should be gone. The feeling should be gone. It's pretty calm. Hmm? It's pretty calm, yeah. Yeah, it's calm. And, but the most important part is the rejection part's gone. Okay, that's good. You can, you can sit. It's that easy. It's that easy. How long do you think that took? What we just did? Less than a minute? Hmm? Seconds, really. And that happened when? Today? Past few days. Oh my goodness, do you see how easy it is to take care of it? You don't have to let anything, no negative emotion needs to last a couple days. Did you, did you attempt to try to get rid of it? Yeah, I tried. Huh? I guess it's hard for me to also distinguish what's my emotions and what peace a little bit. Um, also, I think it's a little bit difficult for me to distinguish what's like peace completely surrendered and just what's my, or what's not true emotions, if that makes any sense. Like, because I, I still feel like a little anxious, but I didn't know if that was just like, but then I still feel kind of peaceful down my spirit. Okay, so. come on back up. We're going to do it all over again. I want to <laughs> I I I teach know. while we have an example so that people can see. You're, you're done. You already did it, but I want you to come up anyway. All right. This is very typical. A, a rejection issue. Stephen had a rejection issue of few days ago, all right? And he had it a few days ago, and when he came up, we had him close his eyes, picture the person or situation, 
feel the feeling, and he could. It was rejection. We let Christ the forgiver in him go to it and through it until it changes to peace. For men who have been, who have been trained to dial their emotions down, instead of just peace, and you, that can, you can even confuse them sometimes with peace, just say, did the, did the rejection feeling go? If the rejection's not there, that is sufficient. You don't have to feel lightning bolts or a, or, or a euphoria. That's, uh, that's more than you need to experience. Because basically when you feel nothing, nothing is actually good. Because if it's not nothing, it's going to be a toxic emotion or it's going to be a noticeably good uh, sense of the presence of God. But nothing, when you actually feel nothing, nothing is the absence of, of a lot of conflict. So, you know, you've got nothing to lose. Uh, there was a second part to what you said, though, about what is mine and what is... Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're probably trying too hard to feel, how do I know that's God or me? Mm -hmm. Nothing is good. Mm -hmm. Nothing is the absence of toxic. So you, it's more by default, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's more that nothing, you're at least walking in the light that you have. And God doesn't require anything more than that. You walk in the light that you have. He will give you more light if you need to know it. And so... Uh, the good thing for Stephen to know is basically, if you feel nothing, if some people would give their right arm to feel nothing. And he did say, uh, I caught you say a little bit of anxiety. Almost everyone that comes up here for prayer, I can feel a little bit of anxiety because most people click into performance like, oh geez, now I got to do it. And it can be real mild and real subtle, but I'll still pick it up. And then I'll just say, okay, don't worry about it. You can't do this wrong. And I'll feel it go away without praying it through. That's just, that's just your flesh gets tense. So the anxiety was probably no more than, Stephen, come on up here. That would make most people a little, they go like this. But that's not like you've got something wrong with you. That's just normal. But then as soon as you come up and say, look, Stephen, this is okay, this is easy. You can't make a mistake. Most people, without any instruction, let the anxiety go. They go, oh, okay, I'm okay now. All right, thank you. Thanks. I wanted everybody on camera to see that good-looking young man, so if there's any uh, beautiful young ladies out there and they just don't know what to do, you got to get here on Tuesday night. So, um, Anyone else? question. Let's stay on, on the Holy Spirit for tonight. You got a question? Oh, okay. It's better than me having amplified two mics. Yeah, I've got, I just felt like tonight would be really good to just really get the nitty gritty to find out where people are at. Uh, get some questions. All right, Ben's got one. <laughs> Um, taking questions. Just taking questions. Anything that has to do with the Holy Spirit. Anything at all. And if I can't answer it, Jennifer will. Or Gloria. I was picking on Gloria tonight. Anything? Anybody? Okay. Should we give fictitious names? Okay. Sally in the audience has a question. <laughs> so you were, you were saying that um, you don't have to hold on to things for a long time, like right. you talk about days, and I agree with you, and I think that's a good way to proceed forward, but I held on to things for years, and they kind of, it felt like they just kind of got in my bones, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I, it, it, it seems to be coming off in layers. Is that... A reasonable uh, way to could, look at it? You, you could use that terminology. This is all subjective, so our terminology is probably going to overlap somewhere. Uh, I, instead of layers, I would probably say progressive. Because when you get to know Christ as a Christian, it's a progressive unfolding revelation. Therefore, when you say, Christ, search me, O God, for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways, there will be a progression. So layers is not that far-fetched 
that's uh, one way of looking at it. But really, it's God is searching the heart, and he's the most efficient at knowing what to put his finger on based on where you're at. The good news is, however, this, this, here's a misconception in the spirit that needs to change because we've developed this based on bad experience. And that is, uh, I once heard a person say, oh, they experienced the dark night of the soul for 18 months. That was totally unnecessary, but that was their experience. In other words, had they been equipped with, with the tools or the know-how, what was 18 months could have been, like in Jennifer's case, uh, what, what had been many, many, many years, Jennifer dealt with in less than two months. So it's really a lot of it, that's why we call it intentional sanctification. You don't wait till you have a problem or a meltdown to deal with your stuff. What you do is you basically go into prayer when you're feeling good and say, God, search me because I want to make advances quickly. So, it, but it does come off in a progression that I think God understands better than we do. Like he will wait, like Jennifer had like a major overhaul in a two month period. And then some of the issues that were serious were farther and farther apart where he dealt with really stuff way in the past. In the beginning, it was rapid. In the beginning, there's a trap too. The trap to the mind is that, oh my God, I'll never be done. And that is just a plain, plain mistake. Because if you had 14 years of, a, of a, an abusive childhood, it does not take you 14 years to get better. That's not God. If you had 14 years of a bad childhood and you had perhaps 300 horrific traumas, we haven't run into anybody that had 300 horrific traumas. But if you had 300 horrific traumas and you did five a day, You'd be, done in, you'd be done in weeks. Two months. Two months. Six. You'd be done in, in, uh, in less than a couple of months. And I haven't run into anybody that had 300 trauma. Because keep in mind, don't minimize the efficacy of the Holy Spirit when you got saved. There's a whole lot that's gone. So don't make it... Most of the people we started with struggle with the fact that, oh, this works, this is good, this is fast, but oh, my life... No, no, you, you don't have to do it all over again. The bulk of the past, if properly applied, could take months. Then, periodically, as you mature in the Lord, God will say, you know what, they're ready to deal with this. And he'll put his finger on it. But there might be a six-month period between stuff. I've got my cord wrapped around me. <laughs> okay. So, anything else? Yes. Mandy's got a question in the back there. <laughs> oh, I'm just making up that name. It's the, it, if you had the red baseball cap, you could have been the Holy Spirit. Um, Personality-wise, I'm not the best in routine. And um, so doing this, as I drop down and everything's going well and then all of a sudden it comes to the forgiveness and I'm like oh here we go again and it, it becomes a little bit more um, I mean I'm yielding and my spirit is open but it it begins to be for me I feel a little forced like I'm um, okay. pulling on the Lord instead of just and so mm -hmm. okay there's two things there two one is I was a young Catholic and I was convinced when I first got saved, I had a Catholic mentality that unless you go to the confessional, and Dennis had such a bad thought life, that I would better go in the confessional, walk out of the, and hope that I got run over by a car because I would blow it before I got home, just with my dirty mind. I, I mean, and so when I came into the fact that forgiveness was a reality, it was like a two-sided sword. First, it was like, oh my goodness, I don't go to the priest. I have Christ in me and he forgives. The problem is I started to feel I can't do this because it started to feel like pressure that I am so messed up that I have to ask for forgiveness every five minutes. I've got to go to work. I have a life to live. I can't be asking for forgiveness for every five minutes. But fortunately, 
What I did was I tried anyway. And instead of getting the frustration, when I would feel the frustration, instead I learned something that really stuck with me the rest of my Christian life. I would, instead of trying to do what's right, I would, I call it melting into the love of God. I did the opposite of trying. I would just say, here I am. <laughs> And the beautiful part was because I kept on forgiving, I saw that the instances, that's what really set me free. Was, I was thinking, as bad as I am, I did notice that as I practiced it, the instances of me needing to forgive was getting farther and farther apart. And that encouraged me to put up with it. Yeah. it it's not like that. It's more like, I understand what you're saying, like melting into the Lord. And That's I'll, yielding. Right, right. And but then it as soon as like the forgiveness, it's like it almost becomes methodical instead of it's like, you know, when you just get in the routine of, okay, this is a routine, la 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 la. And I mean, I can feel I mean the, the presence of the Lord is present and I am yielding. But as soon as it hits that like forgiveness, it's almost like I feel at times like I'm pulling on him instead of just, but I, I am yielding, but it, it's like, um, it's almost like you said sometimes, you know, like this is not a formula. Mm -hmm. But that's what sometimes it begins to feel well, like. The only thing that could possibly mean is yielding and trying are opposites. You can't do both at the same time. It's impossible. It's like trusting and trying. You can't do them at the same time. So if you're yielding, the method part should really go away. That might be more a product of your, your thought life to where the thoughts are coming in and trying to trump the experience. You might be better off just in experiencing and not thinking about it because what I would call it is it's normative to yield and let him do it all. You might be, you might be sabotaging through analysis. That's, that's very possible. People do that very easily. So uh, to just take the analysis and offer that back to God and say, you know, and actually it's okay to I analyze all of my healings after the fact when I got time, not during, ever during, because that's that sabotages. Okay. Anybody else? Yep. So there's a guy. Okay. Ralph. Ralph's got a question in the back. Ralph. Ralph. So uh, uh, there's a guy that uh, that I'm trying to work with on this, you know, and he he's very close. In fact, we almost did it today, but he, long story. Anyway, so I talked him through what to do so he could at least try it on his own. And, uh, <clears throat> but he, he knows there is literally demonic things he feels coming out of him. So he's, God's kind of getting him to this point by himself. He just, it's like right there, but doesn't have the tools. I mean, he's, people are coming to his mind. Feelings are occurring. He just doesn't have the process down yet or whatever, you know, what you want to call it. Mm -hmm. We haven't really done the second module, but I'm learning because I've been listening to the CDs. Is it the first part you're forgiving? Okay, so, so when it's combined with the demonic, but there's unforgiveness there. Uh -huh. You're getting, are you getting, you have to deal with unforgiveness first, close the door, and then you deal with demonic, right. correct? Yeah. I just want to get that straight because we had a big that's talk That's absolutely about it right. Okay. And that's usually the missed, the missed. The what? That's usually what's missed. The People, they get preoccupied with, with demonic activity or with the thought life and fail to nip it at the power source. So I guess his question was kind of how do I know when I get to the end of that forgiveness for that section before you go deal with the demonic? Peace. Okay, when the peace comes and covers your heart. And God won't play Pentecostal games. He's the spirit of truth. If you get peace... There's no greater uh, way to ratify a supernatural transaction because God won't put his, he's the spirit of truth. He won't put his peace on a lie. Almost. Wait till he gets the microphone. 
Jennifer has a comment. In dealing with the demonic, almost always, almost always, in my experience, as soon as you dealt with the negative emotion that gave it legal ground, without having to do deliverance, without having to do anything else, in almost all cases, it just left. Almost all. Mm -hmm. Because if it doesn't have any legal ground to hold on to, the there only, you go. The only part that's confused, uh, everything I've ever uh, prayed with, I would say 98% of people, I didn't have to. Uh, young people who really do need to take authority for them, that's different. But the average Christian adult, when they close the door, they're applying the work of the cross. It says, submit to God, resist, and it has to flee. The only problem I saw is that the flee period <laughs> can be different. And some people get back in their head or they get scared in their emotions and they open the door back up. They give it legal ground because it will flee, but it, there's no timetable. And I think the way... The, the way God impressed that on me about the timetable, submit to God, resist the devil, he must flee, but it doesn't say exactly how quick. <laughs> Jesus faced the, the devil in the wilderness 40 days. And I'm sure he was submitted to the lordship, right? <laughs> but 40 days before he flee, then he did. He f um, uh, there is um, a thing after you deal with the emotion uh, where you could yield to Christ the deliverer to push anything out. But the only time that I've ever had to do that was um, a religious spirit, you know, from being, getting driven, being too much like a Martha. And I would say, Dennis, I feel like this really pressure coming from inside of me. And then I received forgiveness and yielded to Christ the deliverer to push it out. But that's the only one I've had to use that extra step. And, and then we teach, we teach that too. If you've got peace and you still feel like there's a wet blanket on you, uh, didn't we cover inside, outside? Does everybody know what I mean by inside, outside? Inside, when I say inside, I only mean in your spirit. In your Bible heart. Where the will, the emotions, the conscience, all of that's located in your Bible heart. Inside here is the way you negotiate. You must go, if, if we're going to worship him in spirit and truth, we meet him spirit to spirit. You also discern from your spirit. Your head doesn't know what, your head will judge, but your spirit will discern. And your discernment isn't valid unless you're from, coming from the place of peace. If you're all angry with somebody and you say, I discern they got, I don't know, you don't know what you're talking about because you cannot have the eyes of Jesus while you're in a, a sinful attitude. You will judge. Discern must be preceded by peace. If we were to look at it sideways, it would be, let's say this guy's over here. <laughs> He's going that way now. Uh, we just changed his position. It would be love, the love of Christ, the very nature of God, precedes Peace. This peace is within, but what's within is also guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. It's like, it's like armor. And so when you receive forgiveness, you're back into the love nature of God. You're back in him. Whether you feel love or, or not, it's not the point. The point is, positionally in your spirit, you are experiencing right standing with God as an experience. And that means that you've got peace with God. And this peace will guard your heart. Demonic activity comes like this. You will still feel it. But just because you feel it, it's like leaning on your door, even though it's an invisible door. It's leaning on your door. You feel it, but you don't take it in. Most Christians make that, and I'm seasoned Christians, including leaders that we've prayed for, have a bad habit of taking it in when they feel it because they're not making the distinction. But if I feel a bad atmosphere and something feels really yuck, if I feel peace way down in my gut, 
if I've got peace in my gut, I still feel fear in the room, then I, that tells me that's not me. Because me, the real me, the new creation me, is at peace with God and peace with people, but I feel this yuck coming on me. That's actually doesn't bother me because for me that's just discerning the atmosphere it just happens to be yuck in the atmosphere and if it's a person then it also from that place of peace I could discern how to redemptively minister to them effectively because I'm not busy poor me it feels yuck in the room instead I feel the yuck I can make a distinction as to what kind of yuck it is and how can I possibly help that individual that way you're redemptive oriented as opposed to but what's nice is you will feel, if this was anger and it was at demonic proportions, you would feel the anger. But I don't know how to explain this. You would just have to experiment yourself. Behind, <laughs> behind feeling or bearing witness, that's the best term, bear witness. You're bearing witness to the anger, but you know that you know on the inside of you, you don't have it and you're not going to take it. And that teaches you to be militant in a redemptive way in a hostile environment. But people that, get, that take it in get so upset, to me they're just punching at the dark. They don't know if it's flesh, they don't know if it's demonic, they don't know what it is, and they're guessing. And even some people ministering to them are guessing. But uh, the average believer could learn how to not make it a guessing by making a distinction. Actually, discern means to make a distinction. To make a distinction, to perceive, to differentiate. And everything is either human spirit, God's spirit, Holy Spirit. I mean, uh, evil. Evil spirit. You have a human spirit, even before you were saved, you had a human spirit. And I find it, this is probably the strongest anointing that actually helped us learn whatever it is we're teaching, is that from the time I was a baby Christian, I could feel a human spirit. Not just mine, but as I got acclimated to mine, I found out that I could perceive other people. But by perceiving other people was not looking for what's wrong, although that stands out. It was basically just feeling the nuance of what was coming from them. It's far more important to know the Holy Spirit. You feel some people that have basically, you just feel like, even on a bad day, you can still feel love coming from their spirit. Some people have peace coming from their spirit. Some kindness, some mercy. And it's all coming from the love of God, but it's almost like they have different flavors and you get to know them by that flavor. And that way, you know them more by Holy Spirit and by the Spirit than by their shortcomings. I really am, I've never been bothered by people's shortcomings because in every case, there's more God in them than there is wrong with them. Really, that's the way you should look at the next time you see somebody that you think is really flaky, say there's more God in them than there is wrong. Did this just cut out momentarily? I don't know why that does that. But anyway. Um. I have a question from Ustream. Okay. okay. I have so many hurts and disappointments, mostly from Christians. I try to walk in forgiveness and keep a right heart. It's so hard, I realize I'm feeling quite broken and don't know what to do. Okay. The first thing to do is is if it's that hard, there's probably, your intentions are wonderful. You have a good motive, you're trying. But if it's difficult, there's probably something you're not doing right. You could be trying to forgive, and that's, that's hell on earth. Because you don't have the capacity to forgive anybody. And your flesh doesn't even want to. To f truly understand forgiving these people it's basically saying, I can't do it. That would be your starting place. Admit you can't do it, just like you're admitting basically there. You're telling me how hard it is, and it was Christians. And, and, and basically, it would be good to make a prayer appointment. You can go to the website and actually get somebody to walk you through. 
Jennifer just suggested that is the best, the best alternative. Because I can explain it, but that's not the same as me praying with you. Praying with you want a subjective experience. Someone else would be, yes. <laughs> yeah, Dennis and Jennifer don't do the prayer appointments, but everybody's been trained, and this is easy. Let me have uh, Pam, could you come up here and just let me walk through? I want the person that on the on the use, use stream, I want them to watch how it should be done so that they're not struggling with it, okay? We're just going to walk. Well, maybe you have one, so we'll, we'll get double work here. Just close one. your eyes. <laughs> Good. My sister. Okay, all right. Well, let's assume this fella, <laughs> and if she's watching, she didn't mean you. She meant someone else. <laughs> okay. Put your hand down here. Okay. When you close your eyes, and this is for the person on Ustream, and even though it's a lot of people in the church, if you just do it one at a time, it will not overwhelm you. If you try to run all those through your head at one time, you will be overwhelmed and you won't want to do it. But she's got one person, so right down here, that person, just nod your head if you're picturing that person up here. We already know who, who she is. Allow yourself to feel right here. Nod your head when you can feel the feeling. Okay. Now, the one that's watching on Ustream, this is the difference. Yield, relax, don't try. She's doing it. And let, let, allow, let, allow, don't try, let, I let, I open my heart, I let Christ go to that hurt and through that hurt until it changes to peace. You just did it, right? Mm -hmm. Is my timing good? Because mm -hmm. I know what's going on inside of you. Isn't that exciting? But here's the more exciting thing. If I know by bearing witness to the tip of the iceberg of what's going on in her, how much more should she be responsible to pay attention to what's going on in her? Knowing that other people can bear witness and they can feel what, your, what flavor you have. And momentarily, when you pictured her, the flavor was hurt. Mm -hmm. And so if I can feel your hurt, and I'm only feeling the tip of the iceberg, you shouldn't be living with the rest of that iceberg, the other nine-tenths on the inside of you. And if you're watching by Ustream, did you see, uh, the person that's watching by Ustream, did you see how long it took? So even if you've been hurt by 300 people in the church, you could, you could do in a matter of seconds any one of them that come flashing to your mind and you would be free of the torment. Otherwise you live with that pain because those hurts that happen in church, they don't go away, <coughs> they get buried alive. And if they're buried alive, that means they can come back up at any given time, mm -hmm. mostly at all the wrong times. If you did five a day and you had 300 church people that hurt you, You'd be done in 60 days to get on with your life. I would say the bulk of the most horrific things that have happened to any Christian. We did one lady in Canada, the Micmac Indian woman. She was beat with a belt by her father till it left scars from the buckle. She was sexually molested by a babysitter. She was raped. She had three abortions and watched her son murdered before her eyes on the reservation. Most people haven't lived that. Mm -hmm. And she was so gloriously changed in less than 10, 20 minutes maybe. Yeah, one, at a time. one at a time, we did that. And that was with 15 pastors watching. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the 15 pastors watching didn't know what to do. And you actually have more tools right now here in this room and by Ustream than what they did because as soon as she went ballistic, they looked at Jennifer and I like, Here's one for you guys. Mm -hmm. It's not that they're not loving. It's just that if you don't know what to do to help somebody, mm -hmm. but if you find out what to do to help somebody, then you're nice and accountable. And I like that part. <laughs> because there's a wounded, hurting people out there. And this, this, this uh, man or woman that, that, uh, that just sent in Ustream, that is, there's more of those people in the church than there are who are not. And we need to do something about it. There's no excuse for having so many wounded people in the church without the tools to know what to do about it. 
Okay? Now here's a way to test the spirit, being we're talking about spirit. Close your eyes. Picture that person. Feels good, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And that will last you a lifetime. The fruit of the spirit, the fruit remains. When it's the fruit of the spirit, it remains. If it's just doing it intellectually, it's not, you're going to have to do it again and again and again. And then you're going to say, I can't do this Christianity thing. It's too hard. That's because you're doing it, too, you're, you're doing it the hard way. Okay? Can Thank I you. share how the, the, yeah. the giving prayer? I used to have a lot of problem with um, being hurt. I'm, I'm raised in the 60s, but being hurt about racism and whenever I would see something like Roots or, you know, in the 60s the way they were lynching black people, I would get so fier fiercely angry. And I just did the forgiving prayer and allowed the Holy Spirit to just to move through that. I could, I could see a little baby in the Ku Klux Klan you know, outfit, and I said, oh, he's so cute. You know, I don't, there's no pain or any anger associated with uh, racism or injustice, you know, injustice at all. I just, I just, it's just t totally gone. And let me tell you, wow. nobody says stuff like that in front of me without me knowing the truth. <laughs> I could, she, her, her words had nothing but purity on it, and the last part even had a strong anointing. Mm. That's something only God can do, but God will do that for everybody if they know how to do it from the heart and not try to do it up here because you could struggle up here for a long time and mean well and be sincere, but you can still be sincerely wrong by not letting God do it from the heart. You're the excellent. Thank you, Pam. That was a great testimony. You have a question back there? Miss Sally? Uh, you've taught a lot on discernment of the human spirit, God, and then the evil spirit. And one of the things I feel like God's been dealing with me lately on is the religious spirit and how you differentiate between your will and the religious uh -huh. and how God, how do you recognize that religious spirit rising up? And Jennifer brought that up. Um, and it can be very subtle, it can be very, it's, for me it's harder to discern in myself than I would feel like an evil spirit or, that's, that's a harder one to differentiate. How do you? Uh, actually, I would, I would go by the motive because discernment of, of, the, of the spirit is to, to detect the true source and to tr detect the true source, the Holy Spirit always leads. Religious spirits always, even if it seems mild, they drive and they impel you to, to do. And you feel like, I have to. When the Holy Spirit leads me, it's a want to. It's a drawing. It's a wooing. It's, a, it's like he draws you with cords of love to do the right thing. And the grace of God is really the ability to obey. But a religious spirit always has two parts. If it goes to the brain, it's accusatory and it will, it will use scripture, but you won't feel the love of God attached to it. You'll feel the pressure of law. It'll feel oppressive. So is it fair to say that when you're dropping down if you don't encounter um we and you term it peace but if you don't have the supernatural exchange of feeling his pleasure and his heart in that particular exchange um then it's not enough to to go through the process maybe that's what you were mm -hmm. struggling with it's like you have to feel the pleasure and the exchange of what he's doing in that particular dropping down situation. I would use the word assurance because everything that happens down here is no so not no so no so when you got saved you would say things like I know that I know the even reason you say is because there was a knowing in here all inner knowings that are down here are either seeing hearing or touching and they all feel like they have life on it the other thing that you can tell a religious spirit is if it, if God's telling you to do something or you get a, a, a sharp scripture and it's pressuring you and you feel like quitting, 
or taking a nap, trust me, that's not God. That is a religious spirit trying to drive you, impel you, condemn you, slow you down. But the, the, the feeling will always be a kind of pressure, but it won't have life on it. You know, like they say, life or death is in the power of the tongue. Life depending on the source. And the source will have life or it'll have death. Even if God were to give you something that would really take a step of faith, it would still, when he said it, it would still have life on it. If you're hearing something and it doesn't have life on it, and it's a have to instead of a want to, I would question it. That's not perfectly foolproof because some people have uh, prejudices and God's trying to get you to do something and it's coming against your prejudice. Which, by the way, is interesting. In your spirit, a prejudice can be confused with a bad witness. I've watched it happen. And here's what I did one time. I had a guy that I was praying for, and I knew he was going down because he was yielding, and then it was like there's this whoosh that happens right before they fall. And I went inside. I go, yep, there he goes. And then he went shortly after that. There was another minister that didn't believe that that should ever happen. And he went, and in his spirit, he went, <clears throat> and so I said, oh, I see what's going on here. I'm just going by feelings. Nobody's saying anything. So I says, uh, tell me the truth, uh, my good preacher, friend. You didn't witness that, did you? He says, no, I didn't. I says, by what faculty was I operating in that I knew that you didn't witness that? I witnessed that was a work of the Holy Spirit and that basically I have a peace about that. By what faculty did I operate in to pick up your, could it be that you have a prejudice and call it a bad witness? Because in reality, what you should have said was, I never saw anybody fall before. Holy Spirit, is that you? That would have been the better way to approach. Is that you, God? Inquire and require of the Lord instead of just going, hmm, that ain't God. We've got people right now in the body of Christ that actually are implying uh, charismatics are all nuts. And that uh, the implication is kind of that uh, truly if I do something supernatural, he would have done it with my group. And that's, that's as arrogant as you can get, really. If that's truly real, then certainly I would have been able to do it. So, start arguments. Anything else? Any toughies? If it's tough, Jennifer will get it. Is this helping? Is this helping? Because this is... Uh, the, the thing that I would like to see people do, and this is the stage we're in, in in our church based on what God's speaking, is if a person was getting rejected over and over and over again, our church is well equipped to drop down, release forgiveness. Drop down, release forgiveness. But I want to take a more militant stand of maturity to where instead of just being very proficient at forgiving people who are rejecting you, you could stay a victim the rest of your Christian life. I want you to get to the place to where you can make enough distinction and get so used to walking in the peace of God that you get back there right away when you lose it. And then if there is something that somebody just releases some rejection on you, you feel the rejection, but you don't take it in. Then you're moving in offensive, normal Christian walk. The normal Christian walk should be a victorious walk. We should not be giving up all this ground to the enemy that basically Jesus bought and paid for in advance. So it's really how to be more, more on the offense. I was going to save this for this other stuff for Sunday, but it's really good. I don't know. I, um, maybe we'll touch on this a little bit. Give me some more questions so I, don't, I can save this. This is the good stuff. Mandy. 
Um, Randy. <laughs> Uh, one of our children. <laughs> one of our children. <laughs> Not mentioning any names. <laughs> um, one of our kids had dropped down, and they pictured somebody, and then they had a actually a really good feeling towards that person. Um, so we had just mentioned, you know, that they said there was no pain there, but just actually to begin releasing love to that person. Was that correct, or do you think... That can be correct, but it's the best defense mechanism in the world. Okay. Because, see, we're taught, like, we, we had elders do this. Um, I don't need to forgive anybody. I've forgiven everybody. Then you say, okay, close your eyes. Who you see? My mother. What's the feeling? I love my mother. They were taught to give the right answer to get affirmation more than give the opportunity to feel anything wrong. And if you really had a wonderful mother, you're going to be a little prone to not want to experience it. But guess what? Even if you had the most wonderful mother, you didn't always respond to her correctly. At least allow them to deal with it. So loving intercession is legitimate. However, I am always hold it in suspect and say, but is there anything wrong? Okay, so maybe validate, like it was a friend of theirs. So it was a really dear friend. So maybe validate, I know you love, you know, so-and-so so yes, well. Yes. And that's such a good friend. Perfect. But that's exactly what there I could done. still be hurt. Is, yes, you know, that's, exactly, okay. that's exactly what we did with adults and children. That's, okay. a, that's good. You're, that's a, you're getting to be a troubleshooter. That's exactly what you do, is you have to realize where they're coming from. And in church people, you have to realize. So what we did with that elder's wife who basically said, oh, I've forgiven everybody, I've dealt with everything. Then we, we just asked her husband, who was in the room. He goes, what about your neighbor? Well, what about your sister? What about the kids when they don't come home for Thanksgiving? I mean, well, she was manifesting in no time. This person who loved everybody and forgave everybody, all of a sudden there's man. So sometimes you just need to find a way because we're taught to say the right answers. I'm actually trying to break that in the church. There are people that need ministry and they are hurting so bad and they won't get ministry because it's not nice to say something about somebody. And if they really love and respect the person, they're not gonna tell anybody, but that's only harming them. Find a safe environment and say it, okay? The greater the pain, the more you have to forgive. Like if you've been abused by your parent, your mother, okay, and I'm, I've been praying about my mom trying to deal with that and get that forgiveness flowing, and it's helped me a, a, a good bit. But still, the greater the pain, I, my flesh don't want to take the pain, so I'm having to forgive. Okay, here's it's the key. It's a terrible cycle, you know. Right. Well, that's okay. Because I, even when I'm, if I see somebody really getting emotionally distraught and we prayed through three issues, I stop mm -hmm. and let them soak in the Lord. Because it's, even if they did three issues a day for two months, I mean, they would have a radical life change. But when it comes to the, the, the uh, pain, always, always, if you're watching and you're helping anybody, always do this because I've watched, I've watched other people lose potential people who could have been helped because they just didn't, they refused to say what I was telling them to say. Momentary pain. That word momentary carries enough weight to move a mountain. Mm -hmm. A person who, nobody wants pain. We do everything in our flesh to avoid pain at all costs. We drink, we take drugs, anything to avoid pain. But when you tell someone momentary, they will face anything. All of a sudden, the fear is gone. You tell them momentary pain for eternally f being eternal freedom. I haven't run into anybody that wants to argue with that. They would rather face some momentary pain for some freedom. What they're used to, however, is counseling, where you dredge up the stuff, look at it, you feel the pain, and come back next week and get some more pain. Because if God doesn't take it, there's nothing, there's not been a redemptive cause. And they mean well, because there are some people that will always need experts. Some people will always need medication because they don't want Jesus. Some people, and I'm not saying everybody that knows Jesus 
can't take medication because it alleviates to a point. But the point is there comes a time when Christ is all and in us all and he is available. You will see rapid improvement in a short period of time.